It's One Nation Restorations, and we're restoring another American-made tool with American-made tools. Renovations are underway at One Nation Restoration Shop, but after just two sheets of drywall, I took a time out from the job because the blade wasn't cutting right and it was slowing things down. Our American wallboard saw blade is all dulled out, and today we're going to show you how to get it back into top shape. For this project, we're using a Stanley 206 wallboard saw that needs sharpened, the teeth need set, it has years of sheetrock left on it, the handle needs some visual upgrades, and you'll find the usual rust issues that most of these vintage tools have. We'll start by taking off the years of drywall dust and the rust on the blade. The bulk of this knockdown was done with 120 grit sandpaper. The block you see here wasn't used for leveling, it was just used to add height to the blade because of the handle. Try to sand in one direction, otherwise the cross patterns are going to show up in your finished product. Now the Stanley stamp on the blade means the pits cannot be taken out. If you sand to the bottom of the rust pits, you're going to sand to the bottom of the stamp and completely remove it. The trade-off for keeping the stamp is that it means this piece will not be going to the buffing wheel to get polished. What good are polished pits? And number two, the polish inside the stamp will prevent the white paint from adhering properly. It also means the blade will have to soak into a solution to get the rust out of the pits. You need to remember that the teeth are going in two different directions here, and you're going to need to individually sand the ones that are going away from you. After you finish, switch to a 220 grit to give it a cleaner look. For this blade, we went one step farther to a 320 grit because the smooth grit is not going to go into the stamp and it's going to preserve that white paint after it's reapplied. While Stanley has been around since 1843, this 15206 wallboard saw is a relatively new addition to their tool line. It was introduced as a direct upgrade to the keyhole saw, which has a 10 to 12 inch blade, which was often hard to use because it flexed while you were cutting due to its long size. This particular piece was one of the earliest models they made, but you can still find them for sale today, but the country of origin is no longer USA. The wood grain on the handle will typically run from top to bottom, so be careful not to sand against the grain. It's way easier to put this thing into a lathe or a drill press and hold sandpaper over it while it spins, but scratches will be much more noticeable if you do that. Now I used a 120 or you could use a 150 grit to do the initial knockdown and get through that old finish. This particular handle had stain that soaked in way farther than I would like to see into the wood. That means that some of it's going to be left behind and I'm going to need a darker stain to help hide this. After getting through what you can, move to a 220 grit for a smooth soft feel to the wood. Apply the stain, wait 10 to 15 minutes and gently wipe away any of the remaining. After four hours, repeat the process if you want a darker look. Apply one to three coats depending on what you're going for. In this case, we did two coats. For the pits, I used Evapa Rust Solution. With each use, it loses more and more of its strength and it takes longer and longer for the stuff to work. You'll know it's at the end of its lifespan when it either stops working or it turns to a real dark color. You've stretched out that $20 about as far as you can get it for that one gallon. It's time to get a fresh new one. We're going to be dumping this one out after the project. The blade itself is dulled out from years of use, and it's the most important step in this restoration because it's the actual reason the piece is underperforming on the job. I used a vintage American saw file that I picked up on eBay, but yours should be a three-cornered tapered file. Start with the file flat for the first 7 to 10 teeth, meaning perpendicular to the blade. For the next set of teeth, lean the file slightly forward because these teeth are going to do the bulk of the cutting and you want a more aggressive angle on them. In general, the closer you get to the handle, the more of an angle you want on the file, but pay attention to your blade's angles and just follow it. These finished up around 45 degrees. It's also important to remember that you want the same amount of pressure on the file the entire time, even if you're changing the angles, and keep a smooth stroke all the way across each tooth. How often you sharpen your blade depends on how much use it gets. I can't imagine that this blade has been sharpened very often, if ever. For heavy use, you might do it once per week. For light use, you might only do it once per year. The easiest sign to look for is when you start to get tear out instead of cutting, then you know it's time to sharpen it. After a half a dozen or so sharpenings, the teeth on a blade are going to need to be reset. This Stanley pistol grip saw set was made in the 1950s and a piece like this in this kind of condition is about $80, but you can get one for much cheaper. Setting the saw means bending over the upper part of the tooth. This can be done before or after you sharpen the saw, but if you're going to do it after, make sure you don't damage the teeth. There should be a series of numbers on the anvil adjustment wheel. Loosen the slotted screw and rotate the wheel until you have the distance that you want to bend the teeth. This should also have a hammer that can be adjusted to about one half to one third the length of the tooth. You're only going to be setting the teeth that are leaning away from you in the first run, which is every other tooth. 
After you finish, turn the saw around and make another pass to do the teeth that you skipped that are now facing away from you in the first round. If you're sharpening a keyhole saw or something with larger teeth, this plunger size will work for you. But if you're sharpening something that's smaller, you're going to need a thinner plunger. A thin plunger will work for any size, so if you're only going to buy one, I'd get the thinner plunger. Now that the blade has been properly sharpened and set, it's time to paint the Stanley stamp. You don't want to fill in the letters with too much paint, so a light coat here is better. Once dry, use a 320 grit sandpaper to remove the surface paint. It's going to take a little shoulder burn here because the 320 is going to gum up in the paint, so frequently move to different spots on the paper until you get it cleaned out. If you're having problems with this step, use a flat block because this will prevent the paper from getting into low spots if you're using your hand, and it won't give any grooves out or take any of the paint out from the stamp. If you found this tip helpful, click the subscribe button for more great tips to come. It means a lot to the channel right now, and I want to thank everyone for all the support you've given so far. One final look at the old wall board saw and it's on to the new look. This blade is going to make light work out of the remainder of the cutting that has to be done in the shop. There's about 18 more pieces that need to go up in the first floor and now I'm going to have them done by the end of the weekend. That's the difference a quality American made tool can make. With drywall work, the worst part about it is sanding the compound. The less mud you can use, the easier your life is going to be in the end. That's why I always draw out the electrical box after measuring its location, and I don't start the blade in the corner. I'll cut to the corner and then double back to the other one. This will allow for crisp corners that fit snug around the box. This saw is cutting, just like the day that it left the store. It's going through the sheetrock with very little effort here. You can see just how clean the cuts are, and there's no sign of tear out anywhere along the edges. The tip is the only area that I might sharpen a little bit more, but even that's going through the drywall with minimal effort and no tear outs underneath. The saw feels so balanced in my hand that it's easy to cut down and follow along the lines without guides. The tip of the blade gets the cut started, but the portion from the center to the handle is making the biggest cuts per stroke. I'm curious to see just how this blade stacks up and performs after all 18 pieces are installed. I've captured every step of the upgrades in this shop, ranging from digging the 18-inch trench for electrical to the installation of the eight American-made bay lights. So be on the lookout for this video to drop sometime this summer. And on top of that, look for the unboxing videos of some of the newly purchased American-made tools for the shop. If we can buy American, we do. If we can't, we find an old one and restore it. If you've cut the hole carefully, then the mounting bracket on the receptacle will not clear the hole. Make sure you remove the outlets before installing the sheetrock. I guess now is a good time to also remind you to turn off the breaker. Now, these normally aren't installed if you're at the sheetrock stage, but we had to get the electrical inspection done before we could put up the insulation and One Nation Restorations couldn't wait for that. With the receptacle out of the way, you can see just how snug the opening around the box is thanks to that newly restored saw. I like to put a drywall screw above and just below the box for extra stability because this is a high use area. This restoration took about six hours to complete. My favorite part of the restoration was getting to use the restored blade on the sheetrock for the first time. The total cost to restore this piece was about $7 on a can of paint and some sandpaper. The longest part of the process was bringing the blade back to its glory days with a three-step process. We restored another American-made tool with American-made tools. See you next time.